Hello everyone, it's great to be here with you today. Uh, my name is James Doherty. I'm Director of Design at Dover Colon Partners, which is an urban design firm in Miami, Florida. What I'd like to speak with you about is, is urban growth patterns and their effect on environmental performance. And in particular, I'd like to make a comparison between uh, late 20th century American suburban patterns and late 19th century Central European patterns. You know, far too much of the United States and far too much of the Earth at this point has been built according to this pattern, the, the suburban pattern. Here, the land uses are scattered across the landscape. So you see stores in one location, for example, houses in a different location, offices in a different location. And the only way to get from one use to another is by the automobile. How many of you have development similar to this where you come from? Almost everyone has, has this someplace in the world. So what our office specializes in is taking these same ingredients and bringing them back close together so that uh, they're intermixed in a fine-grained way. And it's possible to get from one use to another by the automobile, but now it becomes also very comfortable to get from, for example, a place where you live to a place where you want to shop. You can get there on foot or by bicycle very comfortably. And so we're bringing these things back together again to make the city. We first started doing this work a few decades ago, and uh, when we first started doing the work, um, we were doing it to improve people's daily lives. We realized that people were spending way too much time sitting stuck in traffic, going from one of these uses to another, sitting stuck in traffic jams. And all of this time sitting in vehicles was very bad, for example, for people's health. We see the sedentary lifestyle, having all kinds of health problems and so forth. So this was the origin of the work. What we've begun to realize since then there's been kind of a global outcry that the way that we're building our cities, this idea of connecting things by the automobile, is creating problems not just for individual people, but it's creating problems for the health of the planet as well. So it's really becoming an emergency to do something about the, the settlement patterns and the way that we settle on the land. I was lucky enough a few years ago to get to move with my family to Hungary. My wife is Hungarian and from here originally. And so now we live in Budapest. And uh, I telecommute to my office in, in Miami. And uh, what I've realized, we've had a chance to, to, of course, see Budapest and then also to see a lot of the other cities and towns in Hungary. And what I've begun to realize is that there's fantastic urban fabric here that was built during the late 1800s. And uh, the cities, the, the way that they're put together could well serve as a model for future developments. They basically show uh, and embody a lot of the planning principles that we've been using in our work in America to try and reconstitute the city. The United Nations has been looking at this kind of global problem of climate change. And they also have, have recognized the settlement pattern of cities as one of the primary problems that needs to be solved. Uh, what they say is essentially one half of 1% of the land area of the earth is devoted to human settlements and cities. And yet those cities are producing almost half of the carbon that's going into the atmosphere. Half of the greenhouse gases are coming from cities. So it's a huge proportion of the overall problem is coming from this relatively small percentage of the land use, which are cities. And so what they talk about is the idea, for example, of creating compact and walkable cities. And this is one of the methods, actually, for helping to solve this, this problem of climate change, along with the other strategies of technologies and so forth. But settlement pattern is key. So for this analysis, my hypothesis is that the Central European historic cities may provide good models. What I did is created a side-by-side -side analysis comparing an American suburban example. So this is a classic edge city. This is Tyson's, Virginia, which is near Washington, D.C. in America. Um, it has the, the kind of classic pattern of a separation of land uses. You can see stores in one location, houses in another, and the, the roads that connect them here. And it was built uh, according to kind of classic uh, use-based zoning in, in America. And so a very classic example of, of suburban pattern. And I'd like to compare that in this analysis with Seged, the fabric of Seged in Hungary. And Seged is interesting because historically it was almost entirely demolished by a flood in uh, 1879. Um, and then it was rebuilt as an ideal city of its time right after that. And so it's, it's actually a, a great illustration of the planning principles of the late 19th century in Central Europe, a kind of a pure example. You don't see the evidence of the, the medieval fabric, for example, as much as you do in, in some of the other fantastic cities here. And so it's a very kind of a pure example of planning of that time. And I also chose these two examples because they're quite similar in terms of building height. And so if you look, for example, at a, a spectrum from, uh, from rural to urban, both of these two examples 
uh, the, the building heights are generally within the two to four story range, and so the character in terms of building height is similar in both Tyson's Virginia and in Seged. In Tyson's, there's a, a bit wider range, so you see some of the, the buildings are a bit lower and some are a bit taller than this range, but generally speaking, there's, there, these two examples are comparable in terms of building heights. So these are the two tissue samples, two sample areas, one from Tyson's Virginia, one from Seged, Hungary, that we're going to compare side by side. These two sample areas are each one square kilometer in size, which is, is large enough that uh, if there are individual anomalies in the examples, the, the impact of those is lessened. Um, a one square kilometer is also quite similar in size to the, the standard pedestrian shed, which is a planning convention used when developing walkable places. It essentially is a circular uh, measurement and it takes uh, approximately five minutes to walk from the edge of this circle to the center of the circle. So if you have a neighborhood that is approximately this size, it will feel, generally speaking, comfortable to walk within. So a useful size for a sample area for this reason as well. Now for the analysis, the criteria for the analysis, I pulled them from uh, the United States Green Building Council, who is in the last uh, several years developed a set of LEED standards. You know, they're, they're well known for their LEED standards for the environmental performance of individual buildings. They have a new set of standards that they've incorporated recently within the last several years for neighborhood development. So LEED ND, LEED for Neighborhood Development, um, is essentially looking at beyond just a single building, it's looking how mo multiple buildings fit together to create an urban structure and uh, it rates the performance of these urban structures environmentally to see how they're performing. So what I did is I looked at these standards and then chose the criteria that were the main ones that were focused on the physical arrangement of a settlement on the ground. And so we'll go one by one through those and compare the two examples side by side. So the first is intersection density and connectivity. Uh, this is key because it's one of the characteristics that lasts the longest. You know, individual uses in a place may change over time, and even individual buildings may change over time, but the pattern of streets tends to remain constant for hundreds of years. And so this is a very important characteristic. Um, Lead ND, it rewards projects that have a higher degree of connectivity and a higher intersection density. So you can see, for example, here, Tyson's has only 31 intersections per square kilometer, where Seged Hungary has over three times that, 98 intersections per square kilometer. What this means is that in Seged, the traffic can distribute more easily, and it's shorter in terms of walking from an origin to a destination. It's easier to walk from one place to another. Uh, what that also means is that in uh, Seged, because there are more streets to distribute the traffic, there's less traffic per street, and therefore the streets can be more optimized for pedestrians and for bicycles. And if you look at the example in Tyson's, this is one of the smaller streets there, but it's still largely devoted to the automobile. Basically, the, the fewer streets in Tyson's cause more cars to move on each of those streets, and uh, therefore the street has to be more optimized for, for automobile traffic and less for pedestrian and cyclist. The next criteria that I analyzed was building footprints, the arrangement of habitable space on the ground. And Tyson's Virginia occupies only 14% of its land area with buildings, and Seged Hungary occupies 35% of the land area with buildings. Um, what this means, it means a couple of things. In uh, Seged, you can see that the, the various land uses are closer to one another. So if you want to walk, for example, from one use to another, you, you don't have so far to walk. If you, you don't have a, an area of no building to, to walk across if you're trying to get from one thing to the next. There's more continuity of, of, the, of the built environment. Um, it also means that to achieve the same amount of, of yield, the same amount of, of square footage, for example, or square meters of, of use in that square kilometer, you can achieve the same, the same use with lower buildings in Seged. To essentially achieve the same amount of square meterage of buildings in Tyson's Virginia, you would need buildings that are more than twice as tall because they're occupying less of the, of the land area. The footprint is smaller. So it's possible to achieve a, a lower, kind of a, a comfortable character with a, a city like Seged and get a very high yield of square meterage. Um, it's interesting here when you look at the, the land in Tyson's Virginia, the buildings are kind of scattered across the landscape, and there's a lot of leftover uh, remnant spaces that are, that are essentially unutilized, mixed in between all of the buildings. It's not a very efficient use of the land. And interestingly, when you compare it with Seged, there's essentially no wasted space in Seged. Every square meter is being used for something. And even something utilitarian like the water tower in Seged has been incorporated into a space that feels really good for people. The next uh, metric 
is private outdoor open space. Access to private outdoor open space is very important for livability. Here you can see that the, the percentage of private outdoor open space in Tyson's is actually higher at 21% and Seged is 14%. Uh, what's interesting is the distribution of that space. In Tyson's, it is almost all allocated to single family houses, the, the gardens around houses, where in Seged it's much more evenly distributed across the urban area. In Tyson's, there's a large portion of the land area that has no private outdoor open space. And in Seged, there's, there's ready access to private open, outdoor open space throughout the entire urban fabric. So again, in Tyson's, you see the private outdoor open space happening in house gardens. Seged, the private outdoor open space largely occurs in the form of these, these individual courtyards. And so they uh, have a high degree of privacy um, and, and this ease of accessibility. The next metric is public outdoor open space. Access to this is another key aspect of livability for a community, for a settlement. Here again, you see in Tyson's, there's, there's essentially almost no public outdoor open space in Tyson's. Only 2% versus 17% of the land area in Seged, which is dedicated to this. In Tyson's also, the public outdoor open space is largely remnants of natural systems. You can see on the left here, a remnant of a wetland waterway running behind houses is essentially what's been preserved as public outdoor open space. In Seged, by contrast, about half of the land area of the public outdoor open space is preservation of natural systems, the river, for example. Um, and about half of the outdoor open space is public gathering places, like Seicheni Square here at the middle. And you can see also a beautiful waterfront park in Seged and a, a beautiful paved plaza as well. So there's a wide variety of types of public outdoor open spaces in Seged and they're distributed in a way that they're easy to access from a large portion of the urban fabric. Now, this is a, a, an important one. The distribution of parking footprint is uh, one of the biggest differences between these two fabrics. So in Tyson's Virginia, you can see that a whopping 40% of the land area, it's an incredibly high amount of land area, has been devoted to parking, where only 3% or so in Seged has been devoted to parking. In, Tyson's, you can see that this parking is essentially the element that is pushing those buildings far apart. The experience of walking from one building to another is essentially walking past these parking lots, and so it's a horrendous environment for the people. It's a very inhospitable environment for, uh, for people to walk as they're trying to go from place to place, so it's no wonder that people want to stay inside their cars in an environment like this. In Seged, by contrast, the parking, when it does occur, is largely tucked into courtyards in buildings, similar to the way that the private outdoor open space was. And so when the parking is occurring, it's essentially shielded from view from the streets. So when even parking does occur in Seged, it doesn't disrupt the street space, and you've got a kind of a continuous urban fabric in Seged leading from one use to the next. And then the last metric for comparison here is thoroughfares and spatial remnants. As you might guess, in, in Tyson's, Virginia, the land devoted to thoroughfares is less because, as we said at the beginning, there are less streets in Tyson's. This lack of connectivity is, is evident. 20% of space for thoroughfares in Tyson's and 29% in Seged. One interesting thing you can note here looking at these two diagrams is that we had talked about when uh, connectivity is severed, when there's less connectivity in an urban fabric, traffic has to take the streets that do still connect. And so essentially you load up traffic, you load up extra traffic on the few streets that do connect. So you can see evidence of that in the diagram here of Tyson's where the main thoroughfares that still do connect through have swelled to an enormous size. And essentially they've become so large that they're destructive. It's difficult to cross them on foot or by bicycle. In Seged, by contrast, because this degree of connectivity is so high, you can see essentially all of the streets are relatively narrow and they feel quite comfortable to cross. This is a, a view of the largest streets in both of these cases. So in Tyson's, this is the view toward that highway interchange that you saw in plan view. You can see how difficult that would be to get across on foot, you can imagine. And uh, by contrast, you can see this is the ring road in Seged, which is the largest street there, but still comfortably sized, easy to cross, and it actually accommodates pedestrian and bicycle movement along its length very comfortably as well. So, this is a snapshot of a comparison between these two different kinds of fabric. So I hope you'll agree with me that after looking at these two different kinds of fabric and their different characteristics, as we're looking for a solution to build less of places like this in the future, to build places that instead that are more sustainable, these uh, settlements that were built in the late 19th century in Central Europe may well provide useful examples for study and for emulation. Thank you very much.